the homeland of Sunil had been destroyed. With the help of Godera, the civilization had moved to another planet filled with nature and forests. It had been renamed Planet Sunil. Planet Sunil had a lot of wild beasts roaming around the planet. Most of the time, the beasts were passive. However, there was a stone that contained evil spirit deep below the ground of planet Sunil, and it would turn the beasts on rampage once in every few years. Sunil's villages and cities would all be affected. Every time, during this period, the warriors of Sunil working away from the planet would all return and protect their homeland while gathering more helpers. The Sunils were a sad race. Originally, it had just been a civilization without interaction with other planets. It had been peaceful, and it had tried to develop into a better society. Unfortunately, they had been attacked by Dark Star. The Sunils had no way to fight back as the fleets from Dark Star repeatedly fired missiles and lasers at the land. The land was filled with screams and fire, which even drowned the desperation that people had. Dark Star was a mortal enemy of Godera, and it was an active civilization in the Garden Galaxy. Dark Star had found a weakness in Godera's management and attacked the planets under the rule of Godera. Godera had no choice but to exhaust more resources to help the lower civilizations. If Godera ignored the suffering of those civilizations, then they would have lost the public's trust in their ability to control the Garden Galaxy. As an evil faction, Dark Star had broken the intergalactic treaty long ago by attacking a less developed civilizations. Moreover, Shattered Star Ring was on the far end compared to other star systems. So, after destroying the worlds, Dark Star would always disappear in their region for a long time and avoid the declarations of war from other civilizations. Dark Star was like a shadow that slowly consumed the Garden Galaxy. The refugees had been moved to planet Sunil with the help of Godera, and in the beginning, Godera had helped building the cities. It was only after living there for a few years that the people found out about the raging beasts. Moving to another planet would take too much work. The first time that Godera offered help was because of moral reasons, but if the Sunils asked Godera for help again, they would feel that they were owing too much to Godera so they could not ask them for help with this matter. Therefore, they decided to stay on the planet and fight off the monsters. It was the period where the beasts became active again. These missions were requesting help to protect the homeland. The difficulty of the mission increased as the list went on, and there was no one who applied for the most dangerous mission. As for the easiest mission, they needed 120 credibility rating. Hanzio could only select the easiest mission, so he submitted the application. After three days, the group took a spaceship and arrived at Planet Sunil. Whoosh! The door slid open, and they were in a military base. Hanzio stepped out of the door and he quickly noticed teams of Sunil soldiers and armored trucks protecting the base. It was the armor that Sunil soldiers wore. The armor was dark gray, and the armor plate was extremely thick, which could block heavy bullets from machine guns. In matching armor, the soldiers looked like a true unit. The armor suit's weight was almost a ton, and it had equipment that supported the movement. Sunil was a pure technology civilization, and after a technological civilization reached a certain stage, they would always create armor for individual soldiers. Different civilizations had different styles of armor. For the Sunils, the armor was categorized into private class and corporal class. It was also separated into defense style, offense style, scouting style, etc. Other than the armor technology, there were large mechanical weapons, vehicles, and a few light spaceships. With all the machinery lying around, Hanzio's eyes were shining, and he was looking forward to this place. A civilization that leaned toward pure technological progress was the best foundation for mechanic class, and this was one of the reasons that he wanted to come to planet Sunil. Hanzio had described the tragedy of the Sunils to them, so they had thought that it was a civilization on the brink of destruction. They had been expecting nothing but poor conditions and lagging technology, but the scene of this iron forest proved them wrong. The approaching Sunil seemed to be an officer as his face was stone cold, sending the aura of a soldier. I am B-12 Defense Team Captain Neville. I have already read through your information. Black Star, you will be the 1,432th mercenary to join us. I hereby represent the Sunil people in welcoming you to our world. The catastrophe has not started yet, so please follow me to the mercenary resting area. Then I will assign you a specific mission. Neville kept quiet the entire way. Sunil soldiers were not known for their words, and everyone had on a grave expression, as if they did not even have time for idle chatter. They were all focused on their own missions. The metallic smell of the soldiers' armor filled the air, accompanied by an air of silence. The only sound that could be heard was the tanks that passed by occasionally. Sunils used to be known as a civilization that embraced life, their people loved art and culture. However, everything had changed when the disaster struck. 
The survivors had been forced to throw away their previous identities and harden themselves. Bevel stepped onto a platform and explained in a grave voice, The forward scouts have discovered increasing signs of the rampaging beasts. You're here as our hired mercenaries, and we hope that you can all work together to help us overcome this obstacle. After a short speech, Neville got straight to the main point. This planet's underground contains pockets of prophecy stones. Prophecy stones can corrupt the souls of those around them, and the entire planet's mineral veins have been altered by these stones. This is the reason behind the beast's berserk and extremely aggressive nature. However, this isn't the main problem of the catastrophe. The energy contained within the prophecy stones will be released once every year in waves. This is the root problem behind the beast's sudden outburst. For unknown reason, this year's wave has arrived half a year earlier. Our specialized observation department predicts that the catastrophe waves will explode out in full force in around 7 to 13 days. Our enemy is every single beast on this planet. During the waves in the past, we only had to deal with smaller beasts during the initial 3 to 6 days. Then, as the battle reached the 10th day or so, the frequency and intensity of the beast raids would increase. The last 5 days would be the most dangerous period during the wave. By then, most of our vehicles and equipment would be damaged, and most our troops depleted. The beasts we would face then were also the strongest ever, which had been attracted from far away by the dense smell of blood due to the days of bloody battles. At this moment, a mercenary interrupted him and said, You have tanks, airplanes, and even space battleships. Wouldn't killing these beasts be more like a slaughter? Neville gave the man a cold glance. You will understand when the wave comes. The mercenaries were provided with accommodation in the military base. However, Han Zio needed to enter the city to complete the subclass requirements. I want to register to enter the city. Why would you enter the city? I have some private matters to deal with. I have a friend in town to visit. No. To prevent any unwanted accidents, mercenaries are never allowed into the city. You are only allowed to stay in the base outside of combat. You cannot use this reason to enter the city. However, your friend can come out to visit you. Han Zio was not sure what to do. The storyline character whom he wanted to meet did not know him at all. There was no way that he would come out to visit him. Did he really have to sneak in? He had the face disguising tool in his Night Stalker subclass. The chances of sneaking in successfully were quite high. Right. Just then, a gust of wind descended from the sky, and several beams of light landed on the ground. An airship hovered some distance in midair and released down a spiraling set of stairs. One Sunil super after another walked down from the ship. They were all Sunil mercenaries who had been working hard to earn money away from the planet, and had all returned to fulfill their duties to defend their home on the eve of the catastrophe. The Sunil soldiers who were on the ground all raised their heads and looked at these returning warriors with reverence and gratitude. They even performed a perfectly coordinated military salute. Every time the Sunil warriors returned home, they would be welcomed back and treated as homecoming heroes. Han Zio focused his eyes and saw a familiar face. He then shouted, Hey, Lurden. Green Knight Lurden was among the disembarking crowd, and he turned over after hearing his name called. It took him a while, but Lurden remembered that the other person was someone whom he had fought with. Why are you here? Black Star is one of the mercenaries that we recruited. So, you're a mercenary too. Lurden suddenly realized that fact. Yeah, I only registered recently. I hurried over when I heard that your people were facing a crisis. I never thought that I would be fighting alongside you. Han Zio made sure to make good use of this opportunity. I have friend in town that I would like to visit. Could you do help me? If he's your friend, then there's no problem, Neville added. Lurden thought that as the two had already fought alongside each other once, even though he did not really know him, he felt like Han Zio was not a bad person. Also, he was quite powerful. There was no harm in doing him this favor. Lurden then nodded and said, Sure, I will accompany you into town. Thanks. Han Zio smiled. It sure was convenient to have met someone that he was familiar with. One sentence, and the problem was solved. He no longer had to worry about taking the risk to sneak in. Han Zio passed the security station with Lurden, along with the other Sunil supers. Sounds of cheers suddenly exploded from both sides of the road. There were posters of the Sunil supers that still adorned the walls of the city, and the Sunil people rushed out to welcome their heroes home. The upcoming catastrophe instilled horror in people's hearts, but the people on the street currently had broad smiles on their faces, as if the supers had driven off their fear. Under regulation, I need escort you into the city, Lurden said. It seems like your civilization really worships the supers, Han Zio commented. It's more like gratitude rather than worship, Lurden replied calmly. After our race face sudden changed and migrated to this planet, we still don't have enough power to stand on our own. The efficiency of resource gathering is too slow for us to sustain our consumption, 
and we needed to purchase a lot of materials from the galaxy. Therefore, our expenses are greater than our production. In order for us to survive, supers that are strong enough will head into the universe and become mercenaries. Most of their rewards are sent home, and it is the main source of economic income. There was no way for this civilization to build enough weapons to fight the catastrophe. Han Zio had a better understanding of the situation. The Sunil was a civilization in crisis. They could only temporarily rely on strong individuals, such as the supers, to support the entire economy of the race. That was why the people treated the supers like heroes, and one held great honor if one was a super. Han Zio still remembered that Lurden was extremely cheap. In reality, Lurden gave all his income to the race, so he tried to spend as little as possible, all to contribute more to the race. It will bring disastrous effects if this civilization keeps on relying on the supers. Lurden nodded. Once the food chain is destroyed, the entire planet will face an inevitable death. Thus, we chose another way, trying to excavate the prophecy stones and deal with the cause of catastrophe once and for all. The project has been going on for years, and we are cleansing the stones bit by bit. One day, the psychic current will disappear, and the race will never have to face the tragedy of the catastrophe again. Lurden's face let out a sense of hope. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. Han Zio had a decent impression of the Sunils. They were a resilient race with the supers carrying more and more responsibility in order for the civilization to live on. What a pity, Han Zio sighed as he remembered the fate of the Sunils in the previous world. Han Zio used his distorted memories and finally reached an alleyway after circling around. He stopped in front of a black narrow door, and a wine glass was hung on the sign. A bar. The person you want to visit is here. Lurden frowned. Do you have problem with that? No. Lurden remained expressionless. He looked down on people who spent their money for leisure as he thought that it was being wasteful of their money and their life. After all, he had lost his right to enjoy his life. They pushed open the door and walked into the bar. The bar was dim, and there were not any customers. The city was in an emergency state, so no one had to guts to get drunk in a bar. Han Zio walked in front of the counter, and a soft snore came from the back of the counter. The great mechanic Han looked over and saw a man sleeping with his head on the counter. He was well asleep alongside a pile of empty bottles. The item for activation was called. Delvis was a famous ordnance engineer before the Sunil race was attacked. He created a lot of inventions for military equipment, and he wrote all his thoughts in his journal. After Dark Star attacked, Delvis died in the battle, and the journal was handed to Herlis. Han Zio wanted to borrow the journal from Herlis to change his class. Han Zio touched the journal, and the interface popped out a hint. You obtained. He had finally obtained it. Han Zio suppressed his excitement as he opened the diary. He acted like he understood everything, but the journal was written in the Sunil language, which looked like cursive English. However, it did not matter if he don't know the language. The interface showed a progress bar, and as long as he finished reading the book, he could change his class. Through the normal mission, one needed to be extraordinarily lucky to obtain the journal. The procedure to obtain the journal was complex, since no one knew the identity of Herlis. Most people would not think that a stranger working in a bar was that man. Most of the time, the players would only find out about the journal by becoming friends with Herlis and drinking with him. Only then would Herlis would start talking about his brother when he was drunk. However, Han Zio knew the information, so he directly cut to the end without going through the complicated procedure. He had finally gotten the subclass, and the explosive amount of experience points could finally be used. You obtained the class. LV1 plus 1 end, plus 3 int, plus 1.5% machinery affinity, plus 2 free attribute points, plus 1 potential point. You acquired the skill. You acquired the skill. There was a chain of effect between ordnance engineer and mechanic class. The skills and attributes perfectly fit with the mechanic class, and this subclass was equivalent to half of the main class. The levels used for this type of subclass were used at their maximum potential value. Ordnance meant war machinery such as turrets, armor, shields, and so on. This subclass would provide additional buffs when creating and using war machinery. Han Zio pulled out the stack of experience that he had accumulated and spent it all on those two skills. LV-10 When creating or modifying war machinery, the status of equipment increases by 8%, 14%. Note, the buff is based on the original status and does not include statuses from other buffs. This is the same as having another power boost for the machinery. Han Zio nodded and looked at the other ability, which he valued the most. You have been enlightened. When building new war machinery, plus 30% success rate when building a new production line, plus 10% quality of production line, 
minus 18% resource costs, and plus 20% speed of production. Productivity was the essence of this subclass. A mechanic had multiple stages in their development, and each of them was indicated by certain benchmarks. One of them was fast building while fighting, which was one of the reasons the mechanic became powerful in version 3.0. As for the assembly line, it was the mark of the later stages. Mass production was a vital step to develop the most explosive, most brutal, and most costly tactic, which was known as the rush strat. For normal mechanics, they would use the best weapons made out of the best materials. For mass production, the equipment created had low quality. Although the difference in quality would increase between normal mechanics and mechanics that used mass production, the latter could stack up an uncountable amount of machinery and suppress the enemy with numbers. Mechanics and mages were two powerful classes in the later stage. The rush strat from the mechanic and the summon rush strat could turn a one-on-one -on -one battle to survival against a zombie horde. These two battle styles ruined the game experience as exceedingly few players could win against them. However, even though these two strategies were strong, the cost was obscene. After leaving the bar, Hanzio and Lurden wandered in the forest city. The sky was filled with stars, and the gentle light from the stars rested on their shoulders. Even though this planet was a dangerous place, it had magnificent views. Hanzio recalled a quote. The most dangerous things often has the most beautiful appearance. Where are you going? Lurden asked. Just walking around. Then let's get out of here and head to the base. Is there nothing for you to do here? Han Zio asked. Like going back home. Lurden shook his head. I don't have a family. Han Zio stroked his shin and said, What mission do you have? Frontline combat. That's the most dangerous job. You supers had already given your money earned from your blood, sweat, and tears to the race and you still have to go on such a dangerous mission. No wonder you are viewed as heroes. Lurden left to join the forward reconnaissance forces on his own, and Han Zio could only sit and wait inside the military base. However, he had already met his objective for the subclass, so there was no longer any need to enter the city again for now. That day, ear-piercing sirens sounded throughout every single corner of the base. Everyone was already familiar with what that sound signified. Enemies had attacked. The atmosphere in the base suddenly grew tense. The Sunil soldiers ran back to their respective positions in uniform steps, and the mercenaries were also able to quickly find their way back into their groups due to the previous day's training. Different kinds of tanks and armored vehicles were all started up, and a dizzying number of anti-gravity turrets floated into the air. Nine galactic-class battleships slowly took off into the sky, causing ripples of sand and wind to spread around the area. They were like nine fortresses in the air that guarded the skies above Forest City, each facing a different direction. The beasts' roars were like thunder, and the trees toppled in swaths to reveal beast hordes as far as the eye could see. The beasts trampled over each other and charged over as if they had gone mad. It was as if a tide of darkness was washing toward them, quickly filling up their vision. Just this scene alone terrified the hearts of many of those who were present. Open fire, an officer desperately yelled. Boom. At the next moment, the countless artillery installations around the defensive circle all opened fire at once, causing ear-shattering explosions all over. The catastrophe had arrived. Forest City had a total of five main defensive walls. The first consisted of massive numbers of mines and automated turrets. According to the battle plan, this section would coordinate with the supporting fire from the back to disperse the monster hordes. The second consisted of many fortresses, ditches, traps, and electric walls, all to slow down the movements of the beasts, allowing the anti-gravity turrets, main batteries, as well as the battleships to deal significant damages to the beast hordes. The third was the iron defense line. Squadron after squadron of armored vehicles and defense teams lined this section. When the beasts entered this part of the defenses, the battle would enter its close quarter stages, and the defense teams would unleash the fury of their metal weapons on the beasts here. This was also where Neville was stationed. The last two sections were full of artillery formations. Its purpose was to provide supporting fire for the frontline forces. The rapid response troops and other reinforcements were also stationed at the second last section. During the calmer periods in the catastrophe, personnel from the last section would carry out repairs and first aid work for the troops. Black Star Mercenary Group was stationed at the second last section. They were assigned to a long-range heavy armored division, with the code name G7. Three Fortress-class main battle tanks served as the core firepower of the formation. These tanks could attach themselves onto the ground and transform into a single gigantic turret. As a mechanic, Han Zio's job was to control one of those heavy artilleries. He had only one mission, fire the cannon. 
most people with the mechanic class were assigned to similar roles in the base. With their special affinity and machinery-related abilities, they could increase the damage output of these weapons. Pan Zio was of no exception. With a crisis-level event such as the catastrophe, it was basically impossible for individuals to influence the battle by themselves, with only a few exceptions. Boom! Artillery shells drew arcs over the multiple perimeters and covered the sky before they smashed into the distant beasts, causing red mist to bloom all over the hordes. Flesh and bones of the beasts were blown apart, causing a horrifying scene. The black tide was momentarily stopped. However, the beasts in the back were not afraid at all and charged over the broken bodies of their brethren, forcing their way through the storm of artillery shells and explosions. The smell of gunpowder and gore mixed together and wafted into the military formations with a gust of hot wind due to the many explosions. Boom, boom, boom. Han Zio could feel the tremendous recoil every time that he opened fire with his artillery cannon. He fired shot after shot as he watched the shells drew a blazing arc before landing in the middle of the beasts thousands of meters away blooming like an orange flower in the middle of the black tide. He was starting to feel the thrill of freely firing this massive piece of artillery. The black tide was stopped short at the first perimeter. The blanket of covering fire from the back covered every single inch of ground that the beasts were on, and they could hardly advance without leaving behind rivers of their own blood. A newbie mercenary, who was firing his assigned artillery next to Han Zio, said casually, So, the catastrophe isn't a big deal. The beasts can't even get in. Han Zio gave him a glance, but he did not say anything. This greenhorn most likely did not pay attention to when the Sunils briefed them on the beast hordes. This was only the first wave and only consisted of the smaller sized beasts. The artillery bombardment lasted four whole hours before slowing. The support troops quickly rushed through the battlefield to resupply the combat troops. Flamethrower units were also sent out to burn away all the blood and gore on the plains to prevent any disease or sickness from spreading. The soldiers were also replaced by a new shift. Each position had a pre-assigned shift cycle. It was impossible for any soldier to last through a high-intensity battle such as this one without rest. As Han Zio also walked away from his artillery platform to rest, engines could be heard above his head. A new squadron of scout planes had taken off. At this moment, a few dark dots appeared above the horizon. The flying beasts were quickly approaching. There were smaller beasts that were not even a meter long as well as medium-sized beasts that had a wingspan of several meters among them. They looked ferocious and were not like anything the mercenaries had ever seen. Some of the beasts looked like giant cockroaches. The information they gave us stated that flying beasts wouldn't appear until three days into the catastrophe. It seems like they had arrived early. Just as this thought flashed across Han Zio's mind, the G7 commander shouted out a new command. Switch to flak shells and adjust your aim. Fire at the sky. The artillery squadrons followed the order and blew open the sky in the distant, causing bloody bodies to rain down. The fighter planes flew to a higher elevation to shake of the aerial beasts and launched missiles that drew orange arcs through the air. The fighter planes were equipped with a simple energy barrier. The first wave of aerial beasts was only capable of using their sharp claws and teeth and were unable to do much other than make screeching noises as they scratched at the barriers. The fighter planes dashed in and out of the beast swarms, looking like medieval knights that charged through infantry units. This battle was already on the scale of a massive surface battle. Time seemed to pass by quickly amid all the intense fighting. At first, the mercenaries fought in a laid-back manner. However, after three short days, as the beasts increased in number and size, they could not laugh anymore. The continuous fighting had started to draw out the fatigue from everyone. Han Zio did his best to fulfill his own responsibilities and played the role of a gear in a giant war machine. On the fourth day, enemies that could threaten the safety of the inner perimeters appeared. The surface of the ground rocked around like waves, as a group of beasts that could dig and maneuver around underground smashed into the reinforced steel wall of the third section and broke out of the ground. This was the first time that the rear troops had ever seen the beasts at such close distance. The ground burrowing beasts' appearance signaled the start of the close quarters combat. The supers who had been waiting behind the third perimeter could finally make use of their powers. The wall of steel and machinery at the third perimeter finally unleashed their fury. Beasts crawled out of the ground and bared their fangs, rampaging toward the defense line. The sound of firing from the guns of the Sunil soldiers sounded like cannons, with more than one meter of flames leaping out from their muzzles. It was like an invisible enormous hand had sent the burrowing beasts flying, falling onto the ground and getting focus fired, screaming in agony. Their carapace and flesh became mud, splattered across the ground, leaving slimy marks on the dry dirt. 
Hold your positions. Neville's tone was harsh and cold, ordering the B-12 defense team under his command from the communicator in his NCO-class armor. He had 30 soldiers under his command, and their crossfire had stopped the beasts in this area from stepping in. During the gaps between firing, Neville looked around. This wave of burrowing beasts did not cause much trouble. Some armor had been damaged, but no one had died or been injured. Thank you for watching. Subscribe and enable notifications so you don't miss the next chapter.